Well, hello, everyone. This is Ken Hardison, and welcome to another episode of Grow Your Law Firm. And today we have the honor and privilege of having Hamid Kohan, who is the owner and founder of LegalSoft, uh, which does a lot of different things, and I'm going to let Hamid talk about it. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Ken. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very happy to speak yeah. with you and uh, about legal stuff and what we do and how we do it. Yeah. And he's actually going to be one of our uh, key, the first day. You're going to be speaking uh, at the summit, which is the May 16th to the 18th down in New Orleans at the Ritz Carlton. And, and just uh, what are you going to be talking about? Well, uh, the topic is kind of intriguing. It's about how to scale your stupid law firm. And the word stupid uh, doesn't mean to the owners, it means that a lot of stupid things happens in the law firm that I'm trying to prevent. So yeah. that was the topic of the book I wrote uh, last year. This says how to scale your stupid law firm. And we'd be happy to provide that at the conference, at your conference, be giving everybody a, a copy of the book also. Well, good. I look forward to that. Look forward to having you. So tell me, give us your story. How did you end up owning legal soft and being all involved in everything that's going on with legal uh, sure very quick back about me uh, i'm originally a high-tech guy from silicon valley i became an engineer when i was 17 years old and i was in the silicon valley about 20 years and then i moved to southern california and expanded a lot of different uh, businesses in, in the software and automations and so forth and then at some point i started consulting and masterminding with the law practices, bringing the Silicon Valley type of uh, environment and thinking into a law practice. Um, it was kind of very revealing when I started working with uh, some of the attorneys. And when you come from a very highly scalable, automated, completely different mindset of Silicon Valley being trained in that for 20 years, and you come to the uh, a basic law practice and uh, they're like 20 years behind. Uh, I always and, I, and always have been. Long, always long, have been. And I always, always, uh, always the, the they're always the last to Im implement any kind of change. Exactly, and, it, and I always had this thing to say about if I left them alone, they're still bearing carrying pagers and waiting at the fax machine to get a fax. So, <laughs> and so, and then compared to what I came from, was like, oh my god, this is crazy. So I started consulting as a like a virtual COO for several uh, law firms. And the word got around that I go in and I make these changes and I automate, I streamline, and I reduce costs, increase productivity. Again, all Silicon Valley training. And then the word got around and I started doing it for five, 10, 15 different law practices. Uh, one thing I noticed is that I did make a big impact on these practices, but when I left and I reduced my time with the practice, a lot of stuff didn't get implemented and didn't got followed through and it didn't get, you know, to the where it's supposed to go. So I came back in and started sort of doing it uh, for them and providing the services and the staff. So we went from like, a, I don't know, like a four people organization right now to like 200 staff that we have working with 600 plus law firms. And we add 100 new law firms a month to the list that we work with. And I started not only providing the consulting and advising and masterminding, but actually doing it. So that's how we all got started and the word got around and then we're doing what we're doing right now. Okay, so tell us what does LegalSoft do? It's essentially a one-stop shop for any law practices that enables the attorney to do the lawyering and not doing the business side, which is very complicated and complex right now. You know, the business side is right now, as you know pretty well, because you've been doing this for very, even much longer than I have. And you know, the business of law is one thing and the practice of law is completely something else. And no one attorney I have met that can actually master both of them. They're either a good businessman and terrible attorney or a good attorney and terrible businessman. So, uh, that's, with that realization, we started sort of compensating that they are lacking and they're not trained for. Uh, the, one of the first challenges was uh, setting up the practice right, having a great online presence that is consistent and professional and affordable. That means social media, website, uh, client retention, and so forth. Um, then the lead management system was a big thing. Uh, every time I went to a law firm and said, 
how much you cost the client acquisition? They said, I don't know. I think it is 4,000 or I think it is 1,000. And then there was no fact behind it. So I started creating formulas and processes and procedures to actually identify to the penny how much is the cost of the case coming in in any practice type. Doesn't matter, doesn't be PI or employment or whatever. So we start developing technologies, processes, resources to actually manage all of that. Uh, the case management software, a lot of them were operating out of Excel sheets or access or a bunch of different things that was not. So we in, intrigued them to actually go get the right case management software, right automation, right intake, the whole interface structure. So that was one part. The second biggest challenge, which was COVID was a big hit for us, was a lack of a qualified, affordable, willing staff wanting to work in the law practice. They were became rare, they were expensive, they didn't want to come to the office anymore. There were so many different challenges. So we started attacking that problem. And that's where our virtual legal staffing came in. And we started with a bilingual intake staff that are trained to do a specific type of practice type. See, one of the problems I found that again was with consulting with the law firms, uh, like in the PI, they're waiting for that one call to come in that is a seven figure call that is gonna save their practice. And they close shop and go home at 5 p.m. And that call comes like 10 p.m. at night, you know, on a Saturday night. And then it goes to some call center, which is a random person answering for that seven figure call. Uh, but that was totally wrong to me. I was like, I want my own trained intake staff with a sense of urgency and incentives to answer that call, retain it, get me on the phone, make sure I retain them, I'm moving forward. So our intake staff are bilingual, full-time, dedicated, trained by us and trained by the law firm to do a full-blown intake and retaining clients, not just answering calls. I hate the concept of call center. I want retained, not answered. You know, that's right. a big change. Yeah. And then we moved on into medical record retrieval, document retrieval, case managers, paralegals, demand writers. So we do the full spectrum from intake all the way to senior paralegals that we place into the law firm as a virtual trained legal staff. Now, where are these people come from? United States or Mexico? No, we have offices. Uh, we have actually physical offices in eight countries that we have huge recruitment teams, training teams, um, uh, coaching teams that recruit the staff, screen them, train them, and then deploy them into the law firm. And that's not where it ends. Once it's deployed, we have a, two separate teams that are managing that relationship. So we have uh, success managers who handle the law firm to make sure the law firm is happy with the, with the staff and is right. moving forward. And the team leads, which is performance coach who manages the, the, the legal staff to make sure that they are doing a good job, they're happy with their job, they're growing at their job. And they are in uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, Philippines. We have eight countries. That's wild. That's wild. Yeah, because most of the companies that I've seen out there, they just pretty much find you somebody, and then you pay them, and then you train them. You look, you know, you really kind of, there is no, that's it. They find them, and then they start getting a percentage or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, we're not a staffing company. We are a practice growth company because like in, there's an average law firm with us has four in average, four virtual staff from us, which they remain as our staff and they are basically fixed cost to the law firm, no long-term contracts. Um, they can add more, they can cut back, they can you know uh, get replacements real time. And we manage the entire process and we make sure both parties are happy and growing together at the in, at the law firm. Yeah. So what what is you know, COVID kind of changed everything. It, you, you made reference to it, but I think COVID made lawyers sped up the process maybe five to seven years of probably where they should have been to start with. You know what I'm saying? Right. 
I mean, you know, it just, but it takes something like that, you know. I always like to look for a silver lining out of a cloud. And I think that was the silver lining uh, out of COVID for law firms. It was, uh, it, 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 you know, with all these people leaving and, you know, I hear stories every day. I just got off the phone with a lawyer. He says, I can't find anybody. I can't find anybody. I said, well, you need to, you know, you need to go get some people from overseas. I said, there's a bunch of companies out there, you know, and of course I gave him your name. And, uh, you know, the, the deal is, he said, you know, $70,000. He said, five years ago, I could hire a lawyer for $70,000. Right. <laughs> and, then, and then she came back. She says, I can't do it. My, my, my boss has raised me to 80. You have to do 85. And he said, screw it. You know, and yeah. I said, you could, you could get like three paralegals with one of these with these companies, right? I mean, exactly, absolutely. This, this price ranges for our full time. We take care of their benefits. Like one of the changes that, that, that what we do, we take care of these people, uh, like local staff, in a way of we give them health insurance, we give them increases on our own, not the law firm because the law firm is on a fixed cost. We give them health insurance. We give them health insurance to their to their family. We, now we're offering them retirement accounts. So they actually have retirement accounts in Philippines and Ecuador and Colombia, which they're not used to at all. No. But there's a huge incentive. We're doing continuous training and certificate programs. So it's very different. And there is a one major thing to can too. It's not just about the money. Is that the, unfortunately, our resources, local resources, became very entitled. And it's like when they come to work, I have a plenty of them too, by the way, but when they come to work, it's like almost they doing me a favor coming in. The, this remote staff that we place, they are more than happy to go above and beyond. They are extremely excited and grateful to have a job. They're not entitled. They follow instructions properly. They don't bring in their own agenda. You know, it is very, very refreshing when you get one of these staff uh, working for you and you see how productive and how hassle-free it is. Like in California, you can't terminate any employee for whatever reason, any reason whatsoever. You're going to get a letter from some attorney that wrongful termination, this and that. And it's like, oh my God, I don't, I have law firms just be, in California, just because of that single issue, they're not hiring. It's like, I'm tired of, you know, I can't even tell them why they burned down the building. You know, it's like if I tell them why did you burn down the building, I'm gonna get a lawsuit from some employment firm and that why did you tell them to not burn down the building? Well, you know, one thing I would think, since you're offering all these things, these benefits that they've never even heard of, uh, that you probably get the, the the cream of the crop as far as labor force in these countries. Absolutely, because we do a lot of screening, a lot of benefits, a lot of training, and we reward them to uh, stay with us, you know, our retention rate is over 84%, which is, I mean, on local staff in California, you're lucky if you get 50, you know, so they stay with us because we take care of them and we take care of them good and we uh, grow their, uh, their, their careers. Yeah. So, and that's what that's, you know, I was uh, listening to somebody this weekend and uh, they were talking about, you know, it's not like you said, it's not just about the money. You know, if you, your job as a leader is to coach these people up and help them attain their goals. If you help, if you take an interest in what their goals are professionally and personally and, 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 you know, really give a shit and care, then nobody's going to be able to offer them $5,000 more a year and take them away from you because that's just money. You, Absolutely. Know, you know what I'm saying? Um, uh, so that, I think that's the secret to holding on to people. Uh, they think it's all about the money, but it's not. I mean, the two biggest reasons people quit is not money. It's, it's, they, they don't feel appreciated and, uh, they don't feel like there's something that part of something bigger. You know what absolutely. I mean? Yeah, absolutely. We, we, um, we have the law firms review our staff on a regular basis so if they get like a four or five star rating from their, their, their attorneys, they get a bonus from us. If they have a perfect attendance, they get a bonus from us. So every time they do something good or stay good or, or grow, they get something, which is a token of appreciation, especially in those countries 
is that the money is a much bigger thing than it is in the US. So when you're giving somebody $25 incentive for showing up to work every single day at 8 a.m., it means a lot to them and it keeps them around and it keeps them happy. So it's very important element of this, this whole thing. And all of our training curriculums for every practice type is being developed and certified by uh, licensed attorneys in US. So if you have a PI training, is developed and managed by PI attorney, immigration, employment, workers' comp. So it, the training is pretty in, uh, intense to get these people on board, ready to go, and on a fixed cost. So one thing I've been thinking about, I mean, is that this is one trend that I see that's going to continue to go forward even more. But now you got AI. So if you had somebody that was offshore working, Plus, they were smart enough to use AI to do ten times the amount of work, whatever you, however you automate it. And this is your this is your wheelbarrow. You, I, I'm sure you've been thinking about this. Oh, I done more than that, Ken. I'm actually just finished my book on a set up how to scale your stupid law firm. I scratched the stupid and say AI law firm. So I just finished because it is it's a full circle for me coming from forty years of a high tech you know, data warehousing, data mining, and all of that, and then coming to law and then doing that. So when this thing came about in the past, you know, six months or a year, especially with even up and a bunch of other things exploding, it was, it was for me, sort of like I graduated. It's like I got the high tech thing with the legal thing and now it's coming together. So I couldn't sleep for a month because I kept thinking the impact, and my book is about the impact of the AI in the legal industry. It is. It's, it's a huge impact. It's, it's like nothing ever seen before. What do you, what do you see? What do you think it's going to be used to begin with? In well, law firms? Uh, one of the things I spend a lot of time in the book about is how the AI is basically going to eliminate a lot of transactional law. Transactional law that does not require attorneys a skill set to do things. For example, immigration is filling up a whole bunch of forms, bankruptcy, uncontested divorces, estate planning, um, all of this stuff. AI honestly can do much better job than any attorney I have ever worked with because it has unlimited sources, unlimited data, efficient, uh, productive, whatever. So that's on the transactional law which is probably half of the industry. On the other side, on the, on the uh, litigation or contingency-based firms, like the PIs, employment, workers, comp, and so forth, probably one third of the staff, which was the administrative staff, discovery staff, uh, document collections, medical records, all of this demand writing. Right now we do demand writing like is using AI in, in, with our company, which is we are, we are producing 10X demands a day that we were yesterday by yeah. using AI, right? And cheaper, faster, more accurate, more comprehensive and all of that. So there's gonna be a huge hit and the attorneys who are gonna be left behind are the ones who were just gonna treat this as a phase or cycle or whatever. They're gonna be left behind and they're gonna be hurting. Uh, my recommendation is to get ahead of it because this train is moving faster than any train. I was in the era when I started my career in high tech, there was no internet. So that was a big blow up. We went from fiber and cable to internet. That was like, wow. And then I was also in the front of a dot-com era in the 2000, the year 2000 and a little before that. And that was like, wow, now we got this dot com, online shopping, online this and that. This AI impact is 10x of any of those things I just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, I've been reading. I mean, I've been really, I'm, I've been really trying to just like a sponge trying to figure out everything because I'm not, that's the opposite of you. I, I, I can't even type. So, <laughs> but, 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 I, but I have been playing, I, I got on chat. GPT-4, and but I'm looking at, that's just one small part of it. I mean, there's so much more applications that, that this this AI can be used. Uh, and 
you know, I was watching CNN or something or not, and this lady was saying, seemed pretty smart, and said, uh, this is going to be faster than anything we've ever seen. She says, it's at 18 months, it's going to go that fast. It's going to be, it's going to be crazy in the next 18 months. She Absolutely. Said, and, and in my book, I explained the impact of that on each of the practice types, both, you know, contingency-based transactional law versus litigation, what do you, what's going to happen to pre-lead versus lead versus, you know, uh, the transactional law. So, and I so what is going to happen? What is going to happen to these transactional lawyers? They got to find something else to do. Because they are, I mean, it's going to take a phase, phase out, phase in sort of a scenario, but the impact is immediate. You know, I'm already working on several projects where uh, the, the immigration or estate planning practice that it is completely 100% AI. It generates the estate planning faster, better, with a higher quality. And, uh, and it also gives you all the risk factors. Like, you know, when you're writing a contract, like corporate formation, writing contracts, estate planning, um, everybody can always, when you got one of those, can shoot holes in it and says, uh, you have exposure here, you have exposure there, but you, over here, you're solid. But it's pretty much like a from experience or guesstimations or estimation. But the AI will actually give you exact percentage and says you have 18% exposure on this clause on this contract, or you have 24% exposure on this a specific part of the state planning you just did. You know, it's very accurate. It has massive, massive amount of data that is not humanly possible to capture or work with. So it's going to be a big change, and I think it's going to grab a whole lot of people by surprise. Yeah. See, if I was a immigration or bankruptcy lawyer, I think what I'd be thinking about is uh, because some people still, you know, still are not going to want to use AI. They're going to want to go to a lawyer because they're scared of, you know. And I would do it to where I could be more uh, put out a lot, do it a lot cheaper and compete. Right. Have a lawyer look at it and give them an answer to question. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I, I it's an 80-20 rule, uh, Kendo. 80% of the people, especially the new generations, they don't have those kind of uh, needs sure. or uh, requirements. They want to do everything. Like, I got two kids in law school. They pretty much live off of their cell phone. Like, they don't want to go... They they want to do telemedicine, they want to do telelawyering, they want to do teleeducation. Everything is like, in my cell phone, I can basically live in it. Uh, they don't want to go anywhere, meet anybody, or talk to any lawyer or a doctor or, or you know, uh, education folks. And they're just like, can you bring it into my cell phone? So that's the generation that is coming up. So we got to be ready for that. And then you, the attorneys that you mentioned, they need to find add value to the AI. Yeah. You know, that's what they got to find out. They say, okay, the AI is going to basically take over 80% of my practice. If I want to keep it, I got to bring some add value on the top of the AI instead of fighting the AI. Yeah. Now, you got to deal with it. I mean, you know, people don't like change, but, you know, if you don't, you got to change with the times. If not, you end up like uh, Kmart, yeah. you know, Radio Shack. In circuit city and not bed down bath and beyond and a bunch of yeah. other things. Yeah, yeah, all of yeah. these people were basically ignored the trend of the market and they thought they can fight it, change it, modify it. They didn't bring any ad value, never changed. If you went to any of these stores you mentioned, they're still operating like it was 50 years ago. Nothing has changed. Yeah. And and you can't do that. So that's that's going to be a very key element of uh what's going to happen here. Yeah, I think every law firm owner out there that's listening to this should, should should write this down. You should go to your people or go to people that know more than you do and ask, what is there anything in our law firm we're doing today that we could automate or use AI to make it quicker, more efficient, and better? Yeah, I, absolutely, every, absolutely every, right. Every, every process, every task needs to be looked at. And what can we do to automate this? What can we do? To use AI to make this to where it's more efficient, and and you know, and then we can go to these four day work weeks, and we can do this, and we can have this. You know what I'm saying? It's going to, yeah. 
You're uh, absolutely right. And that's what we do. We encourage and we help everybody who comes to us and asks those questions. Or we have, I had this thing uh, set up a long time ago called uh, a practice tune-up. Uh, there's actually uh, the book I'm working on is how you tune up your, just like a car, you tune up your practice. Like you said, from the beginning to the end, you know, I need to check my engine, my transmission, my electric system, my tires, my brakes, my shocks, everything needs to be examined. So that's how you tune up your practice, just like you would do to your car, yeah. you know, and they need to do that. And we'll be happy to do that. And I think, you know, at, at your conference is a great opportunity for these folks to actually come talk to people, see the new changes, see new the trends, pay and pay attention. Don't have like these two second conversations or two minute conversations. You have a lot of great exhibitors, a lot of great sponsors at your show. So the people who come, they need to actually spend some quality time with these presenters, with the exhibitors, with the sponsors and take notes, see how it applies to their practice and their process. And then go back and take action on it and don't just come to the show, you know, hang around, get some information and go away. They need to monetize their investment they're making coming to the, you know, conferences yeah. like your conference. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, because, you know, the biggest, the biggest hang up, the biggest obstacle is execution. You know, you, you, can go, you can go and get all these great ideas, but the problem is going back home and implement it. And, uh, that seems to be the biggest problem. That's one reason I, I'm I'm going to speak on execution on steroids. Uh, it's a methodology. I I've stole some stuff from different people and then added my little spices on it. And it's uh, and the all firms that have used it are getting three or four times more done each year. As far as pro stuff that they wanted to get done, big projects. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you're speaking my language. We didn't invent the wheel here. We just basically either teach them how to execute it, hold their hand to execute it, or execute it for them. <laughs> so we have all of the above, but yeah. every one of them it starts with the execution. If you don't it really execute does. it, it doesn't mean anything. You can, you can have a cure to, to cancer in your mind, but if you don't come up with something that actually helps cure cancer, it means nothing. It's true. I do have one idea that I can execute and 20 great ideas that never, never happened. Exactly. So that's definitely the, the trend. By the way, I forgot to say something that it was you started out with to say that I, why did I call my book How to Scare Your Stupid Law Firm? The word stupid actually came in when I was doing a consultations. And every time I had my third, fourth meeting with the, with the attorney, he started referring to things in his firm as a stupid. My stupid intake, my stupid marketing, my stupid lead generation, you know, my stupid accounting. So, so when somebody asked me to actually write down what I was teaching, and the most common thing that stuck in my head is that everybody is telling me about something being so stupid. <laughs> so yeah. that's why I called it that, because it was like, they're the one who put it in my head. I didn't yeah. come up with the concept. Good deal. So is there anything that I didn't ask you that I should ask you? And, uh, and also, uh, we're, we're kind of getting towards the end of this thing, but if people want to definitely come down and see you at the summit, that's great. But if they can't get down there, how, how can they get up with you? By simply contacting the legal staff and asking to uh, set up a session, I'm always open to to meet with folks and talk to them. So legalsoft.com is a place to go and you can uh, contact me and uh, I'm always available. My uh, portfolio is on the on the site. My direct contact information is on the site. They can schedule a call, meeting, whatever they are comfortable with. But most importantly, coming to the summit and spend some time with us and ask the questions and get the experience. I think that's one of the highest recommendations. And after that, if they're happy, I'd be happy to be available to help them. We help law practices grow. And that's our mission in any shape or form through consultations, implementations, uh, guidance, everything is all about how to grow your practice, which is the great part of what your summit is, is to grow your law firm. Yeah. And how ironic, the name of the podcast is Grow Your Law Firm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all we do. <laughs> yeah. All right, my friend, I look forward to seeing you uh, next month. Uh, when people hear this, it'll probably be May. But uh I look forward to seeing you, and I'm, I'm going to be over at your booth picking, picking your brain. 
Absolutely. Right. My pleasure. Always to be associated with you and your summits and your organization has always been great. And it's always a pleasure talking to you. All right. Thank you. Until Thank next you. Time. Yes, sir. Until next time, this is Ken.